The Queen had dedicated her life to the service of the British people and the Commonwealth. And beyond question, that is what she's done. People will remember Queen Elizabeth II. She was somebody who had that great feeling for duty. The Queen, she was like a film star to us. A very sort of gracious, noble film star. When Princess Elizabeth became Queen in 1952, Britain was a very different place. During her long reign, we experienced radical social, political and technological change. Yet through it all, Queen Elizabeth kept calm and carried on. A reassuring presence through one of the most extraordinary periods of our history. This is the story of the Queen and us. It was in the 1950s that a young wife and mother became Queen Elizabeth II. As Britain's role in the world changed, she united the Commonwealth and guided us through good times and bad. And while we struggled with some modern realities, one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Others led us to a closer relationship with our monarch. Television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. As together we reshaped our world. On June 2nd, 1953, three million people packed the damp streets of London. Some had come days earlier to secure their place, while others arrived at dawn, each one wanting to steal a fleeting glance of our beautiful young sovereign on her way to Westminster Abbey to be crowned Queen Elizabeth II. So the Queen has started on her way to Westminster. She looked as if she were illuminated by a, a personal spotlight. She was, uh, it, it was extraordinary. It was something I will never, ever forget. This beautiful, beautiful young Queen and it was like them just a fairy tale. After years of post-war austerity, this was the moment we had been waiting for. All the more precious because the year before the coronation had been overshadowed by grief. This is London. The king passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. The unexpected death of Elizabeth's father, King George VI, shocked the nation in February 1952. On hearing the news, she immediately returned to Britain from a Commonwealth tour and was met by the Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Elizabeth was now Queen, but it was decided that her coronation should be delayed until the following year. Britain was broke, and this was a time of mourning for us all. Tens of thousands of people have paid the only act of reverence to King George VI that they can still perform. But neither the long wait nor the damp cold seem to matter to these, the ordinary people of Britain. King George was a family man, forced onto the throne through the abdication of his brother. And he had been with us through the darkest days of the Second World War. We may have won the war, but the country was deep in debt. And seven years on, we still had rationing. The 40s went on into the middle of the 50s. In some respects, where rationing was concerned, it was much more stringent, really. Austerity had become a way of life. 
no wonder we wanted to put the past behind us and look to a brighter future. Suddenly there was this idea of a resurgence and leading it all was this young woman. A second Elizabethan age was born and on this young queen's shoulders rested the hopes of us all. She really did convey the impression that she had inherited a duty which was an important, not to say sacred duty, and that she intended to discharge that duty with every fibre of her body. The things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. The coronation ceremony was televised live. It was a a memorable a moment in, in which the whole nation shared because, of course, there was only one network, and that was the BBC. Twenty million of us managed to witness the historic broadcast, which was remarkable, as there were only two and a half million television sets in the whole of Britain. A lot of people got bought their first televisions to watch the coronation because it was so important. Everyone on our street was getting televisions and you couldn't be left out, so it was like, Mom, Dad, don't we got to get a telly? We were the only house in the street that had a telly and we had virtually the whole road in our front room. Kids on the floor, grannies and older people on the settee, my mum making tea. For those without access to a television, there were public viewings across Britain. I was in hospital as a little girl having my appendix taken out. And all the children that could walk were given a crown and a cape. And we were allowed to parade through our ward and out into the other wards and pretend that we were the Queen being crowned on that day. I sat there very much the same as everybody else in the British public, fortunate enough to be looking at the television set, gasping at, uh, at the splendour of it all and the solemnity of it all and the joy of it all. And out on the balcony of the palace stands the Queen crowned. The image of a young mother and her children amid this age-old pageantry struck a chord in family homes everywhere. The entire nation was pulled together in a way that they never had been since the end of the war by, by such an extraordinary royal event suddenly becoming public property. The television broadcast marked a new relationship between the Queen and us, one that would unite us through the highs and lows of her long reign. The mood was one of optimism. The world was getting better. We'd won the war, and we were ready to win the peace and create the new Jerusalem. Things were already improving. The National Health Service and a new education system had been introduced to make a fairer society. But we had a long way to go, because in many ways we were stuck in the past. We still had an empire and an attitude that Britain knew best. The population was almost exclusively white and Christian. We were the most industrialised country in the world, and factories, mines and mills still dominated our landscape and our lives. I remember staying with my grandmother and sleeping in her feather bed and hearing the knocker up going along each day, tapping on the window to wake people. And very soon after that, the clogs on the street as people went to work. As kids, you know, there was the remnants of the war and we would just play anywhere you could kick a ball. So either in the street or in a little uh, vacant area. And we would 
called these areas the bombies. So let's go down the bombie. We didn't know that we were playing on bomb sites. We didn't know that those, those buildings that we were going into were old um, bomb shelters. We just thought these were play areas. You know, that's, that's all we knew. I can remember bombed out buildings that we used to go and play on the debris and that. For some bizarre reason, we always thought we were going to find Germans. With two world wars fresh in our memories and conflicts in Korea and Malaya and the threat of a nuclear cold war hanging over us, we remained a militarised society. The Queen, from a family steeped in military service, embraced her role as head of the armed forces. During the decade, she presided over a total of 700,000 regular service men and women and two million conscripts. National service was compulsory for young men who had to serve in one of the armed forces for two years. It was a rite of passage shared by a generation, but for many, it was deeply unpopular. I dreaded it, I absolutely dreaded it. Why and the next one? And it looked like a terrible ditch at the end of one's schooling. The worst thing was the army, and of course I ended up in the army, uh, and in the infantry as well. All the young men, and the parents too throughout the land, didn't want their sons to go into national service. So when it came to the exams to be accepted in the RAF, everybody tried to get out. One boy, I'll never forget, in front of me, he went in and he had one eyeball that would go round like that on his right eyebrow. And he had got the other, he trained it. He convinced him he was useless. And of course I saw him later on in a cafe bar nearby and his eyes were completely normal. Many believe that national service instilled discipline in young men keeping them off the streets and out of trouble. And discipline in the 50s started early. Have you uh, ever been, I wonder, on the receiving end of this? The headmaster used to call it my wand. Bring me, if you went into the headmaster's office, bring me my wand. Schools were allowed to cane, beat or slap children who broke the rules. You call it the strap. The, you'd get the strap for the teacher if you're naughty. A leather strap with three or four prongs, and you'd have to hold your hands like that. And you'd do that, and if you did that, you get another couple. We were deferential to authority figures everywhere, but especially to the Bobby on the beat. You would never answer a policeman back. God, it would mean smack your white man in the head quicker than you could say Jack Robinson. Serious crimes were rare, but public morality was enforced by some unforgiving laws. Homosexuality was illegal, and murder still carried the death penalty. In 50s Britain, we knew our place. And the way we spoke immediately identified where we came from and our position in Britain's class-dominated society. Oh, the way it is in the way it is not. I had a Stockport accident. So my mother recruited an elocution teacher and I was sent along to lessons to, to iron out my accent. It was, an accent was seen as a disability, it was seen as characterising you at the bottom of the pile. What kind of parties are you invited to? This kind of thing? If you find this normal, you belong to the upper middle class or higher. In our family, my parents were both quite shy, and in the presence of upper class people, they would tend to fall silent and just smile. Or is this your kind of party? Would you feel most at home here, balancing your plate on your knee? If so, you probably belong somewhere in the middle classes. We just thought that most people were above us and we had to be polite to them. Or is this where you feel you rarely belong? If so, your background is probably working class. There was this absolute divide. There was none of this mixing. You just mixed with your own. More than half a million people pack Epsom to bursting point. The racetrack was one of the few places where all classes came together. 
even if they didn't necessarily mix. The Queen had a passion for horse racing and attended the Derby just four days after her coronation. Hopes are high that there'll be a royal victory and Harry Carr, who will be riding Oriole, the Queen's horse, seems pretty confident that he'll show a clean pair of heels to the rest of the 27 runners. But it was the nation's favourite jockey, Gordon Richards, who won the day. And in comes Gordon to chalk up his first ever Derby win. Too bad that Oriole couldn't quite win for the Queen. It was a race which had eluded him his whole career. Her Majesty the Queen receives Gordon in the royal box and congratulates him warmly on his magnificent victory. But days out were few and far between. For many in Britain, living conditions were basic by today's standards. There were communal lavatories in a little yard at the top of the street. I think it was being seen to be going to the lab, which uh, was offended my mother's uh, sense of social proprieties, really. Both my grandmothers had lavatories outside, across the yard, as you had to go out in all weathers, uh, where the newspaper was torn up and hung on the peg to serve as toilet paper. And it was full of spiders. I always remember not liking that. Not only did we have an outside toilet, we also had, um, we didn't have proper baths. So the old tin bath would come out. I would literally have a bath in the front of the fire in a zinc bath once a week. And the rest of the time, I would like get my legs out over the sink and be washing the sink. We were very poor. People lived on top of each other. And there was a big sense of community. It's a good life. A lot of love. Every house, the door was open. Every kid went in everybody else's home. If mum and say have a slice of bread and jam or whatever, or they'd come to my house. We loved it. They said we had an out, but we, we were happy. And it was true, really, you know, you didn't have much, but it was a great community spirit. For the Queen, there was a community that spanned the globe. In the winter of 1953, she and Prince Philip embarked on a marathon royal tour of the Empire and Commonwealth. Her Majesty came to land in Jamaica. From the winter of far away England, she flew in over the blue Caribbean. The Queen would travel over 40,000 miles, becoming the first monarch to circumnavigate the globe. When I was growing up in Trinidad, every day when you went to Every day when you went to school, we sang God Save the Queen because we were brought up to believe that the empire was part of our world. I came from New Zealand and I think it was very important for the Queen to be seen because she reminded people that England was home. But the idea of empire was changing and the Queen, in her Christmas radio broadcast, shared her vision for a more equal Commonwealth of Nations. The Commonwealth bears no resemblance to the empires of the past. It is an entirely new conception, built on the highest qualities of the spirit of man, friendship, loyalty, and the desire for freedom and peace. The Queen spent two months in Australia, where three quarters of the population came to see her. I had a, a whole series of scrapbooks of Lilibet in every available coronet crown. And my mother thought we should get a glimpse of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And he was on my side, I saw him quite clearly. And I could see the Queen's little arm going backwards and forwards. 
The tour was a huge success for Elizabeth, whose star quality united the people of the Commonwealth. Heading home through the Mediterranean, the Queen was met by a show of British naval power. Fifteen proud ships led by Admiral Lord Mountbatten and his flagship came out to meet Her Majesty and her family. The Queen herself was sailing in the newly commissioned Royal Yacht Britannia, where she had been reunited with her children. The long months of family separation were over. To these two young spectators, at least, everything was just fun. The yacht would become a sanctuary for the royal family in the years to come. The Queen had launched it on a rainy day in Scotland back in April. Accompanied by the Duke, the Queen came to perform the launching of the vessel, whose name until that hour had been kept a close secret. I name the ship Britannia. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. Britain was hard at work. There was full employment for men. At the start of the decade, almost 40% of the labor force worked in manufacturing. And we led Europe in the production of coal, steel, and ships. Your parents would say, you've got to have a trade. So I went into a ship repair as a welder. But it was a real physical sort of work, labor intensive. I'm black as your head. Coal mining, employing 700,000 men, was not only the dirtiest, it was also the most physical and dangerous work of all. My dad provided 18 tons a day on an eight hour shift. He took out 18 tons. Shoo, 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 and they're moving coal and big pieces of coal for eight hours. Nearly 2,000 feet down in the dark and the loneliness. A young man was putting big pieces of coal on the conveyor belt and shoving them and his foot went through the conveyor belt. And they stopped the conveyor belt as quickly as possible. But that took him alongside. He was in shock. And all he did was talk about his wife and his kids. My wife's gonna be so upset. It's all right, it's all right, we'll wrap you up. They're coming down, the medics are coming down, the medics are coming. I don't know what my wife or dead. My dad said, I've never seen any so cruel in all my life. Coal was still our main source of power, as it had been since the days of the Industrial Revolution. But by the middle of the decade, other traditional industries that had made Britain great were in decline. Smokeless chimneys are appearing in the Lancashire cotton towns as the mills close down. The livelihood of 350,000 people depends on the Lancashire cotton industry. When in 1955 the Queen visited Lancashire, it seemed a deliberate gesture to boost morale for an industry in crisis. One of the departments in the mill seen by Her Majesty was the weaving shed. Here the girls learn lip reading as they can't hear each other talk. Though some women did work in factories and offices, as they had done during the war, in the 50s, most were encouraged to stay at home as wives and mothers. And that's when the real work began. A house is a home when there's someone waiting waiting at the door for you. My mum was always at home. Uh, there were moments when she would like to have gone out to work, but my dad had that macho streak in him, as a lot of Irishmen did, and no wife of mine is going to work. My mother was a housewife, my grandmother was a housewife, and my aunts were housewives. A housewife had to run a household. You had to keep the house clean, spotless, from top to bottom. It was a matter of social distinction. Mm, she's not done her step for several days. It was a job. There weren't washing machines and dishwashers and spin dryers at all. They were industrial wash houses. 
you get in there and there are these huge industrial machines where you pile all your washing in. I have to pull it out and I have to hang everything in the dryer, put it in and wait till it dry, then fold it. And it was a routine that Monday was wash day. Ironing on Tuesday, shopping every day because, of course, there was no fridges, so the food would rot. Spending on food was roughly a third of most family budgets, so new clothes were a luxury. Women made their outfits or mended the ones they had. My mother was a great knitter. <laughs> She'd knit a cardigan in a day. I'd say to Mum, Mum, can I have new sandals and new socks? And she would say, no, no, you're going to have to wait for that. For I haven't got the spare money this week. We were a nation of shrewd shoppers. But we also made our own, grew our own and sold our own. And on one extraordinary occasion, even the Queen and her family joined in at a local church bazaar. It's a sale of work for the local church, but a sale with a difference. The royal family have a wonderful record of serving the people, and today they're going to do it literally from behind the counter. The royal family rarely have occasion to handle money, but you'd think they'd been doing this all their life. The family day out was in aid of a new vestry for Crathy Church, which the Queen traditionally attended while staying at Balmoral. Back then, the church underpinned all our lives. Most of us were baptised, one in seven of us attended church regularly, and we all observed the day of rest. London on a Sunday. Any other town in Britain might look much the same. Today, almost all shops and restaurants are closed. Even the swings in the park were tied up, so you weren't allowed to have the joy of just being on a swing. Sweet, sweet memories you gave. For many workers, Sunday was their only day off. It was a day for the family. One fresh and tender kid. When we all enjoyed the biggest meal of the week. Sunday lunch was small Yorkshire puddings with gravy as a starter and then meat, two veg, and another small Yorkshire pudding with gravy, and then a pudding, apple crumble or lemon meringue pie. So Sunday dinner was the big blowout. No alcohol with it, though. Uh, a cup of tea afterwards. We'd all gather together, kids, uncles, aunties, in one of the uh, relatives' houses, and my dad was the pianist. When my parents would have people over to the house, I was supposed to be in bed, but I would be not... Can I sing? Because they would all be singing. So you red, red, bump, comes bump, 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 and doom, doom, doom. You can roll a silver dollar down upon the ground and it'll roll. Oh, because it's round. You've heard people say we had to make our own entertainment. Well, it was true, and it was a great thing. The radio was our most popular form of home entertainment and we all tuned in to the same programmes on the BBC. I can remember sitting on my dad's lap, listening to things on the radio. Two-way family favourites. And two-way family favourites was huge. People would write in and have requests. The radio was always on. Thinking now about the Queen, I realised she was very much part of all of that, because you hear things like, she loved George Formby. That's what we were into. When I'm cleaning windows, I often see what goes inside. You know, I love, I love the idea. This was a point of contact that you knew she, 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 that rather tickled her fancy too, you know. In a few moments, Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness, Duke of Edinburgh, will come down onto the studio floor to meet some of the artists who have taken part in tonight's show. With more of us having televisions, we could now see, as well as hear the Queen in our own homes. When she visited the BBC TV studios to watch a variety performance, the event itself was televised. And now Her Majesty the Queen moves towards the centre of the studio floor, towards the cameras, the microphone booms, and the massive equipment that goes to make a television program. Children's television became the nation's babysitter. Dutch, yes, I know, all right. I'm just going to tell them about it. Muffin the mule and the, and the little weed who was being, I think, attacked by the flowerpot men behind the shed. 
I don't think that was ever explained to me properly. My father thought it was important that we were, when we got back from school, that we were allowed to watch children's television up until the news. Until 1957, broadcasts actually shut down for an hour so that the little ones could be put to bed. It was known as the toddler's truce. Our most popular source of entertainment was the cinema. And the Queen shared our enthusiasm. The film industry is honoured by the presence of Her Majesty at its own London Film Festival. Film premieres were a regular feature of the royal calendar when the Queen and the movie stars could meet face to face. The royal couple make their way through the foyer packed with celebrities. Brigitte Bardot. Many of these stars, of course, Joan Crawford, for example, the Queen has often met before. But the next star the Queen meets, Marilyn Monroe, over here making a film with Sir Laurence Olivier, is almost an established resident by now. Glamour is the cinema's business, but few of its events can be more glamorous than this. On average, we went to the pictures 27 times a year, more than any other country in the world. And though television was growing in popularity, the big screen had a place in our hearts. Oh, I used to love the pictures. I loved it. They'd used to play the national anthem before the thing started, and everybody stood. You didn't have to sing it. You just had to stand for it while it was played. And it seemed to be the absolute norm. Every single Saturday morning, we had to go to the pictures. It was the big picture and the wee picture, as we called it. As you got older, you could take a girl and you could buy in a box of chocolates. Which is arm around me. <laughs> I loved all the, all the Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly and all those musicals. I loved it. And I think that sort of started to plant the seed of dancing in me, watching all those old musicals. After cinema, ballroom dancing was our favourite form of entertainment. The dance hall was so popular. You know, dances and those ballrooms in Ireland are huge. And at that age where you're aware of boys and you're hoping that a boy will walk you home, it was fantastic. An estimated 70% of all couples found love on the dance floor. My parents met at a dance hall. It was very popular dancing, and the dresses and the outfits, and it was all about getting dressed up, you know, my father with his suits. So dancing was very, very, very prominent in Glasgow. A big part of the weekend ritual was sport on Saturday afternoon, when almost a million of us headed for the big match. When my dad went to the football, he'd get dressed up, he'd go in his suit and tie, and the flat cap. And they all had them, they sort of looked like, they all looked alike, they were all the same, same hats, same suits. I loved that atmosphere. I loved the camaraderie of it all and the excitement of it all. From the moment Elizabeth became queen, our favorite sports seemed to be full of magic moments for our sporting heroes. She was at the 1953 FA Cup final to see Stanley Matthews help his team to victory. A great little wizard has it again. A flick to centre finds Perry, who crashes it home into the Bolton net. Her Majesty the Queen rises to greet the two teams and to award the cup. When the Queen presented him with his winner's medal, it was third time lucky for Matthews at the grand old age of 38. It seems incredible now, but he earned little more than the average worker. A footballer's weekly wage was capped at 14 pounds. Later that summer, another great moment, this time for a cricketing hero, Dennis Compton. No, is it, is it the Ashes? Yes, he could have won the Ashes. Regaining the Ashes after 19 years seemed to be one more triumph for the new Elizabethan age. And to cap it all, on May the 6th, 1954, Roger Bannister became the first man to break the four-minute mile. The tape is broken, and so is the record athletes have long been dreaming about. By the mid-50s, most of us were enjoying a fortnight's paid holiday, and we headed for the coast. 
It was the heyday of the traditional seaside resort. Blackpool was easily the most popular, attracting seven million visitors a year. My grandfather used to run, they called, run a bus. That's what they called it, a weird thing. A bus run from Glasgow to Blackpool. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting in that bus? I don't know how many hours it took. Days, it felt like we were in that bus. But it was very exciting for us to get out of Glasgow because we, I didn't go anywhere. We used to go to Blackpool, but we didn't go to what my mother would call the common. And we went to Cleveland, which was the refined end. It always rained. The royal family also enjoyed seaside holidays on the Norfolk coast, where the beaches were a little less crowded. For those who wanted something a bit more energetic, the 50s were the golden age of the holiday camp. Even at holiday camps where everything is so well organised for you, it's often the campers themselves who provide the fun. It was all knobbly knees contests, beauty pageants and fancy dress. Dawn till dusk entertainment. I remember when I was very tiny, we went to Butlins. And my cousin and I, they put us in a beauty competition, but for kids. The big item of the day, naturally, is the final of the beauty contest excruciatingly embarrassing. Once the holidays were over, it was back to school, where children returned to being seen and not heard. Chalk and talk ruled, and we were taught the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Traditionally, the education we received depended on our social class. Between 5 and 7% of Britain's children are privately educated. They say the boys learn to look after themselves better and, above all, are taught in smaller classes. A high proportion will get top jobs and top incomes. While private schools were often steeped in tradition, by the mid-50s, their state equivalents were beginning to change. Modern primary schools gave a greater opportunity for all, no matter what your background. And what does your daddy do? He's a postman, sir. He's a solicitor, sir. He's a chauffeur, sir. A chauffeur? Yes. When I went to school, the thing I looked forward to when I was little was the little tiny bottle of milk that they'd give you mid-morning. I was always hungry. I was always hungry as a child. The benefits of the welfare state were being felt in free milk and school meals. We were given a quarter of a pint of milk every day and... Children were better fed, healthier and taller than their parents had been. By the end of the decade, they were labelled the beanstalk generation. The new generation of royals was also going to be different. The sports car drives up to the door. It contains a new boy who is making history. Prince Charles, heir to the throne. Yes, this eight-year-old boy is creating a great precedent. He is the first heir to the British throne to go to school. He will be the first King of England to have been educated as a boy among other boys. Admittedly, a boy with a rather special destiny. But his rank will count for little in the rough and tumble democracy of playground and dormitory. Which is exactly how his parents and his future subjects would wish it. For children in state primary schools, one exam could change the course of their lives. Suddenly there was this exam called the 11 plus. The teachers started to tell you and started to prepare you for it. So you realised you'd have to kind of get a bit serious. And I did, luckily, and um, passed and went to the school of my choice, which was the Liverpool Institute High School for Boys, which is a very good school, where I then got free a really classical education. The 
11 plus gave the chance for bright working class children to get into a grammar school and climb the social ladder. There was this belief that you could do whatever you wanted to do. There was a real belief in a meritocracy. I had to beg for the right to go to grammar school. I remember my mum saying, I don't have, we don't have the money for uniforms and books and things. I thought, there's more beyond this town of Portadown and there's more beyond living in a two-up, two-down house. But the exam created a new social divide. I took the 11 plus and passed, and that's when I saw divisions. And it was very bad psychologically because at the age of 11, people were divided into winners and losers. I had no idea that how it could affect the rest of your life. It was just an exam. I failed, of course. While most secondary modern pupils left school at 15 and got a job, many of their grammar school peers went on to become the first members of their families to go to university. Going to Cambridge was the biggest social shock I have ever had. I've sort of never recovered because I went from the smoking chimneys of Lancashire and its rigid attitudes to the, your place in the world to Cambridge, which was one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Dazzlingly beautiful. Coming to Cambridge from Leeds, which was black with soot and on, all the buildings uncleaned and no breath of antiquity about it at all. Cambridge was celestial by comparison. The best and the brightest of the grammar school generation were headed for some of the new industries and technologies which were reshaping Britain. The most dramatic was the harnessing of the power of the atom. In 1956, the Queen opened the world's first large-scale nuclear power station at Calder Hall in Cumberland. When the atomic age opened in the fires of Hiroshima, many believed it could bring nothing but evil. But there were men of vision who had faith in its peaceful promise and worked to fulfill it. Within the span of a few generations, our way of life has been transformed beyond anything our forefathers could have imagined. All of us here know that we are present at the making of history. As the huge dial in the background shows that Calder Hall is at last feeding power into the factories and homes of Britain, it marks the birth of a new industrial revolution in which Britain is taking the lead. There was also a social revolution going on. For the first time in history, young people who were working had money to spend on themselves. The teenager had arrived. We were the teenagers, that was when the word came in. There hadn't been a word for us till then. This generation had the financial freedom not to conform, but to create their own image and lifestyle. We stopped dressing like our mothers and clothes became suddenly casual and not as restricted and formal as they had been. And that was a really important decision because we stopped obeying the grown-ups. I desperately wanted some narrow trousers and I took some trousers to a tailor in Leeds and they, they regarded it as morally offensive that they were having to narrow these trousers and I eventually got them. And uh, my father was so outraged by it. He said, it makes you look like one of them. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, I remember rock. the impact of rock around the clock. I remember saying to people, something's happened. Something's happened to music. Because we're so in awe of American music, we tended to do what American kids would do. Love the dances, love the music. The undisputed king of rock and roll was, of course, Elvis Presley. Well, if your bed leaves you, you gotta tell And he spawned a generation of British pop idols. I remember hearing Elvis for the first time. Since my baby left, Jung Jung. Well, since my baby left me. And we all went. Oh my God! Well, that was it for me. You know, I suddenly was greedy for it. Really, I, I thought, oh my, this is fantastic music. Well, love, 
If the music came from America, our homegrown rock and rollers found a new kind of venue, straight from Italy. In the 50s, we fell for coffee bar culture. We weren't allowed to go into pubs and bars until we were 21, and so there had to be somewhere else for us to go. Two Eyes Coffee Bar. A coffee bar on the top, and then you went down a step to what looked like a railway carriage, a tunnel, and at one end was a small stage. And that's where I stood with my two friends and a drummer, and we just played. Since her coronation, the Queen had attended the Royal Variety performance every year. In 1955, there had been two. But in 1956, just four hours before the show was due to start, news came from Buckingham Palace that the performance was to be cancelled. Britain was about to invade Egypt. The Suez Canal hits the headlines like a bombshell. The crisis had begun four months earlier when Egypt's leader, Colonel Nasser, seized control of the Suez Canal. Nasser's actions threatened Britain's trade links, in particular, vital oil supplies. This is a matter of life and death to us all. The Prime Minister, Sir Anthony Eden, made a televised address to the nation. I was suddenly summoned on a Saturday to go to Downing Street uh, because there had to be a broadcast because we were about to invade Suez. We cannot agree that an act of plunder which threatens the livelihood of many nations should be allowed to succeed. Damn it, I mean, you know, this was, this was World War. We were on the verge of World War. Britain, backed by France and Israel, sent in warplanes and troops. But the United States and the Soviet Union, both with much at stake in the Middle East, had not been consulted about the invasion. International opinion turned against the military action. At the United Nations, the invasion was branded aggression and a ceasefire ordered. Without financial support from America, Eden was forced to back down and withdraw our troops. Britain was humiliated. In the eye of history, I expect it was seen as, as the sort of turning point of the end of the British Empire. The Suez Crisis marked a new reality in world politics. The United States and the Soviet Union were now the superpowers, and the Cold War had become a little frostier for Britain. A year later, in October 1957, the Queen visited the United States, keen to restore the special relationship Britain had previously enjoyed with America. From office buildings hundreds of feet high, a man-made snowstorm floats down into the deep canyon of the New World's most famous street. That's how New York feels about Queen Elizabeth's visit. One newspaper headline sums it all up. The Queen reigns over us today. At the United Nations, she was invited to address the General Assembly. When justice and respect for obligations are firmly established, the United Nations will the more confidently achieve the goal of a world of peace. It was a symbolic gesture after the loss of face over Suez. I offer you my best wishes in your task and pray that you may be successful. It proved, not for the first time, that the Queen had a unique diplomatic role to play. There was simply no one else in the world like her. She took things on. She was a woman who was a visionary, who was knowledgeable, who wanted the best for her nation. And the Queen always tried to make sure, the way she presented herself, that it was for the best for the nation. Back at home, the new Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, was telling us that we had never had it so good. We were beginning to enjoy an unprecedented standard of living. There was a lot more freedom. There was a bit more money floating about. The lifting of restrictions on higher purchase, commonly known as the never-never, fueled a consumer boom. 
Mrs. Harrison, what have you bought on HP? Well, there's the mixer, the fridge, the washing machine, the dishwasher, and the polisher. When white goods came in and you could just put things in a washing machine, it liberated women. I think I remember them getting a refrigerator as well, because up until then I can remember Dad had kind of dug a hole in the garden and keeping, like, milk out there. I, I suppose it kept colder. And the fridge changed everybody's lives because suddenly you didn't have to go shopping every day. New, new, new from Max Factor. High fine lipstick. New high fidelity colour. With the introduction of a commercial television channel, ITV, we were exposed to a brave new world of American-style advertising. America's favourite copy. It's in England now. ITV was seen as very alarming because it meant commercialism had arrived. Murray Mitz, Murray Mitz. And America had arrived and we would all be subject to terrible pressures of advertising and vulgarity. ITV, I'm not watching that. Commercial television, whatever next. This is London. Speaking from her home at Sandringham. Her Majesty the Queen sends a Christmas message to her people throughout the Commonwealth. In 1957, the Queen's annual Christmas message was televised for the first time ever. The broadcast was live, and appropriately enough, its theme was modernity and the pace of change. That it's possible for some of you to see me today is just another example of the speed at which things are changing all around us. Because of these changes, I'm not surprised that many people feel lost and unable to decide what to hold on to and what to discard, how to take advantage of the new life without losing the best of the old. And so I wish you all the fun and enjoyment and the peace of a very happy Christmas. By the late 50s, peace had become an issue on the streets. The campaign for nuclear disarmament was the first mass protest movement since the war. The Aldermaston marches saw thousands, among them many young people, rally against nuclear weapons. We all felt a great weight on our shoulders of an impending nuclear war. Everybody suffered from it. And the young people felt they were being pushed into national service and pushed into war. There was a whole wave of young people. They didn't think of themselves as angry so much as assertive. I mean, it was a matter of, you know, you move over, it's our turn. It didn't happen all at once, and it didn't happen everywhere. But by the late 50s, we were not as deferential as we used to be. Industrial disputes were becoming more frequent as trade unions challenged the bosses. In the docks of Britain, more than two million working days have been lost in five years through industrial disputes, most of them unofficial. But some voices were still struggling to be heard. Racial violence. An angry crowd of youths chases a Negro into a greengrocer shop. After attacks on immigrants in Nottingham and London's Notting Hill, racial tensions boiled over into the streets. Caribbean immigrants, who had come to the mother country to fill labour shortages, were questioning the racist behaviour of some Britons. We were all taught that we were British subjects, and we believed so. The Queen of England is our Queen, but now I find that I'm coming here that we are treated as something different. When my mum first arrived in this country for the first few weeks, she was followed down the street by young kids who asked her where her tail was, because they'd never seen a black person before. So they assumed she had a tail, and they shouted horrible things at her in the street. This violence is evil, and the law and public opinion must stamp it out. Although in some ways we seemed attached to the prejudices of the past, Britain was modernising. 
The latest machinery does away with the need to fire shots and blow away the coal. Instead of a man shoveling coal onto a conveyor belt, a machine does it mechanically. You women have heard of the lab and you've heard... The Industry was becoming more automated. And a new road called a motorway promised to link the north and south, though it came with a suitable warning. The speed which can easily be reached is so great that senses may be numbed and judgment warped. Telecommunications were bringing us closer together too, as the Queen demonstrated by making the first British long-distance call without being connected by an operator. The North Carpest of Edinburgh speaking. This is the Queen speaking from Bristol. Good afternoon, Lord Provost. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. In a few moments, Bristol subscribers will be able to make tank calls by merely dialing the right number up to a distance of some 300 miles. In time, the whole United Kingdom will enjoy the advantages of this new service which the post office has introduced. May I express my gratitude to your majesty for the honor which you have done to me and to Scotland. Thank you. Goodbye, Lord Provost. Goodbye, your majesty. Once knew his children, this old house once knew his wife. This old house was home and comfort as they fought the storms of life. It wasn't just technology that was transforming our lives. Housing conditions were finally improving as the slums in our cities were bulldozed and the inhabitants moved to new homes. There were literally tens of thousands of houses created in Liverpool. They were better than anything we'd known. They had a little front garden, a little back garden. So our parents were really happy to be relocated into these areas. It was a great community spirit. The clearing of the inner cities led to a mass exodus of people to new towns and overspill estates. Suddenly, we moved 120 Blackfriend Road to Cup Kent. Semi-detached, all lovely, smelt new. Honestly, it was like you'd lived in a tent all your life and suddenly you've gone into Buckingham Palace. It was thrilling for my mum and dad to have a flat that was just theirs, with their own bedroom and a separate bedroom for their daughter. I mean, it was magnificent. The Lord Lieutenant of Hertfordshire welcomed Her Majesty to Stevenage Newtown. Stevenage was the first of the new towns envisaged by the New Towns Act of 1946. By the end of the decade, many of the hopes and ambitions of post-war Britain seem to have been achieved. One of the new town industries include the English electric manufacture of Thunderbird missiles. Nobody is going to take liberties with Stevenage. But we could hardly have anticipated the sight of our monarch in a pub. If our world was changing, Her Majesty was coming with us and much to the relief of thousands of young men, national service was phased out, signalling the end of the post-war era.
us.